Welcome to all of you. And if anybody, by the way, is waiting on the side, there are seats over here on the side. So please come and look. There are also seats here. Okay, so everybody can get a chance. We are very, very happy to see you all. We are very happy to have Chris with us, who's going to give us a wonderful presentation on Ophelia in a way I'm sure you've never heard. I want to give you some background about uh, Chris Smith, but, but before I do, I also want to tell you that we have a wonderful reading group on Shakespeare that is going to take place beginning on February 18th, and Chris is also going to be leading that. That is free to you at the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies. If you'd like more information on that, do please go on our website. Go on our website for everything. Um, and I also want to point out before we begin that um, after Chris's talk, I'm sure you're all going to be very interested, more interested even than you are now, in Shakespeare. And uh, there's a wonderful book in the back that you'll see that will be being sold. Uh, it, is, it is called Paint, and it is written by a fine Shakespearean scholar by the name of Grace Tiffany. So. I'll remind you of all that, but let me get now to Chris, because Chris is going to uh, fascinate you for the next 40, 45 minutes and give you a bit of uh, background on Chris. So I'm happy to tell you she's from Brazil, and I'm happy to say that because I'm an anthropologist and I work on Latin America, so thank you. We are going to have the global Shakespeare's from Chris. Chris is regional editor for MIT's uh, research publication on global Shakespeare. And Chris is going to give you insight into how Shakespeare is presented and understood, and particularly how Ophelia is understood in countries other than, than our own here. She also is an ACMRS adjunct scholar, but before she had, before she developed an association with ACMRS, she had a life, and she has both her MA and her PhD from the oldest university of Brazil, one of the finest in Curitiba. She was also a professor of English literature in Brazil for 15 years. Um, and she has been published, I am happy to tell you, on three continents. So Europe, um, North America, and South America. So she has a wide and very interesting background um, in Shakespearean research that people in many countries have read. Um, her book, Representations of Ophelia, will be coming out soon. So that's also something to look for. Maybe she'll give us a little taste of it here as well. And uh, just to point out to you two more things, um, she was also a research professor for a, lead, for a year at the University of Leeds, and she was a reader at the Shakespeare Festival in Stratford. So you're going to get a treat, because not only are you going to learn a bit more than we all knew about Shakespeare, but you're also going to get a perspective on Shakespeare that is not only Anglo-Saxon, so Chris will give you Anglo-Saxon, and she'll give you Brazilian, and she will give you a uh, more ample point of view on Shakespeare than we often get. I am very, very pleased to present Chris. Thank you, Sharona, for this generous introduction. I am delighted to be speaking to you tonight in my favorite bookstore in Arizona. Um, First, I would like to thank ACMRS Director Bob Georg, Assistant Director Sharona Frederick, and Kendra Turby for inviting me. A special thanks to Kendra for organizing everything for and coming up with a beautiful flyer. I got a lot of compliments on Facebook. There is a Shakespeare that we know and a Shakespeare that we don't know. There is a Shakespeare that Shakespeare himself that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. It's not about Shakespeare's conception of Lady Macbeth in Ophelia, but rather about how culture adopted and transformed him. Shakespeare's Lady Macbeth and Ophelia have exerted a strong appeal to popular imagination and have intriguing stories that blur the space of the fictional and the real. The questions that my talk will approach are, what happens when two fictional characters transgress the boundaries of the page? What cultural context prompted this phenomenon? In many senses, Ophelia and Lady Macbeth are opposites. Ophelia is usually associated with innocence and purity, 
And Lady Macbeth is connected with guilt, ambition, and manipulation. Despite their different attributes, both are linked in their descent into insanity and death, even if one succumbs to madness, sleepwalking, and suicide, while the other goes mad and dies in a brook, bedecked in flowers, singing romantic ballads. The best place to start with this topic is England in the 19th century. The Victorian legacy has served as an iconic reference uh, for shaping Ophelia's and Lady Macbeth's afterlives. It was a period of great paradoxes for women. On the one hand, the pervasive image of the angel in the house in Coventry Patmore's widely successful poem promoted a domesticated ideal of a passive and submissive wife. And on the other hand, there was a radical reshaping of woman's, woman's position and rights. Um, the admission of women to university education, the women's suffrage, and the gradual entrance of women into professions are just a few examples of this true revolution. Without a doubt, it was a time of transition and turbulence for women. And it is against this backdrop that we have to understand the phenomenon of the appropriation of the Shakespeare and Harris. It is also during this period that, as Richard Altick describes in his monumental book, Paintings from Books, English literature entered English painting through the stage door. This quote fits like a glove to my talk because I will explore how textual, visual, and theatrical representations converged and played an essential role in the assimilation of Lady Macbeth and Ophelia as examples of female behavior. By the 19th century, Shakespeare's status as a national genius was firmly established in England. The English bard was seen as a speaker of wisdom, and his characters became role models of moral and values. This reverence of Shakespearean characters originates from Romanticism, the residual culture, where fictional characters were analyzed and considered as real beings who had lives outside the text. Coleridge, for instance, looked upon Shakespeare's characters as living human beings. Uh, according to him, in Shakespeare's works, you meet people who speak to you as in real life. They are flesh and blood individuals. This emphasis on character criticism elevated the status of fictional characters who were now transformed into models of behavior and examples of virtues. Given this scenario, it is not surprising that Shakespeare's female characters were reconfigured in different shapes to serve as examples of virtues for teenage girls and young women. My talk is divided into two parts between Lady Macbeth and Ophelia. In each part, I will pursue the same method of mapping their appropriation. I will first look at two editions that adapted Shakespeare, The Family Shakespeare and Tales from Shakespeare. Then I will investigate the theatrical impersonations of the characters by Ellen Terry, the most celebrated Shakespearean actress of the 19th century. Thirdly, I will analyze visual representations of the heroines. This trajectory text, theater, and painting will help us understand how the Shakespearean female characters came to occupy a singular place in the popular imagination. Our first focus is Lady Macbeth, also known as Lady Anne in theater lore, which holds that the play Macbeth is cursed. By abstaining to say the word Macbeth inside the theater, actors would avoid the curse. Instead of Macbeth, they refer to it as the Scottish play or that play, for example. Since I am neither inside a theater nor am I an actress, the gods of the theater presumably exempt me from the dark forces. But sometimes I will refer to Lady Macbeth as Lady M, just in case. Here she is. 
the Scottish Queen is one of Shakespeare's most frightening female characters. When we first see her in the play, she is already plotting King Duncan's murder, and she appears as stronger, more ruthless, and more ambitious than her husband. She manipulates Macbeth with remarkable success, overriding all his objections. When he hesitates to murder, she repeatedly questions his manhood until he feels he must commit murder to prove himself. Lady Macbeth's remarkable strength of will persists through the murder of the king. It is she who steadies her husband's nerves immediately after the crime has been perpetrated. Afterwards, however, she begins a slow slide into madness. By the close of the play, she has been reduced to sleepwalking through the castle, desperately trying to wash away an invisible bloodstain. Significantly, she apparently kills herself, indicating her total inability to deal with the legacy of their crimes. Lady Macbeth's aggressiveness and murderous instincts turned to madness was one of the most difficult Shakespearean heroines for the 19th century. She was generally depicted as a monstrous criminal woman or redeemed in a highly domesticated version of a wife. It is also true that Lady Macbeth did not offer any uh, easy digestions for critics, actresses, readers, audiences, or teachers of Macbeth. Hazlitt sums up the dominant apprehension of Lady M. She is a great bad woman whom we hate, but whom we fear more than we hate. Even Freud seems to hesitate in his analysis of the Scottish Queen when he suggests that she should be seen as an extension of her husband. Others approach Lady Macbeth as an extension of the weird sisters, the infamous witches. The fact is that Lady Macbeth is an absolutely powerful and complex character in her own right, in her 400 year after life, has many a story to tell. The first story I want to tell is that of textual appropriations of Lady Macbeth. In the 19th century, women and children, children helped reshape Shakespeare. So the most popular editions of Shakespeare were the ones that moralized and domesticated the Bard's works with the intention of making him accessible to women and children. The case of the Boulders family of Shakespeare, I, I brought my copy, I, I, I need to show that. <laughs> it's from the 18th, 19th century, family Shakespeare. Um, it's, it, it's an expert gated uh, edition of Shakespeare's work. It's paradigmatic since it became the biggest Shakespearean editorial success of the 19th century. The secret of so much success can be traced to the objectives that Thomas Bowdler lays out in the preface, and I quote, I believe that few authors are so instructive as Shakespeare, but his warmest admirers must confess that his plays contain much that is vulgar and much that is indelicate. There are many editions of Shakespeare with all the imperfection on his head, so I have endeavored to remove everything that could give offense to the religious and virtuous mind. Many vulgar and indecent expressions are omitted. An interesting or absurd scene is sometimes curtailed, and I have occasionally substituted a word which is in common use instead of one that is obsolete." Unquote. Based on Thomas Bowdler's quote unquote purification of Shakespeare's works, it is not in vain that the verb to boldlerize is associated with his name. He eliminated parts of the text that should not be heard by sensitive feminine ears. But surprisingly, Thomas Bowdler left Lady Macbeth practically intact, except for the famous cry, out damn spot, which was changed to out crimson spot. <laughs> Very significantly, her infamous unsex speech was left untouched. So, how do we explain that Thomas Bowdler, a notorious expurgator of Shakespeare, did not soften Lady Macbeth? Maybe the next, next example can answer the question. What is that? So this is the family Shakespeare, and I want to show you this one. Yeah, Tales from Shakespeare. Um, yeah, so Tales from Shakespeare from 18, 
1807, actually the same, the same year that uh, the, the family Shakespeare came out. Uh, it's another very popular edition of Shakespeare's works. It still is. Uh, by Charles and Mary Lamb, and it displays a similar practice. It adapts Shakespeare's plays in an accessible and pleasant prose, <coughs> targeted for a female readership. Lady Macbeth, however, is submitted to an inverse pattern. Her evil side is, accentu is accentuated, and she emerges as a monstrous, treacherous woman who has no humanity. She appears as the main culprit for the murder while Macbeth's noble characteristics are highlighted. The Lamb versions offers a one-dimensional character who never alters nor develops. She is denied any direct discourse in the story and is thus denied a speaking voice, a fact thrown in sharp contrast when compared to Macbeth, Banquo, the witches, and Macduff all of whom reproduced direct discourse from the Shakespearean text. For instance, when Shakespeare's Lady Macbeth unsacks me here speech, informs us of her power and determination, in tales from Shakespeare, Lady Macbeth is never alone. In any scenes which Shakespeare has featuring the lady alone are either excised or conflated structurally reinforcing the simplified reading of Lady Macbeth as a bad, ambitious woman. The gendered moral is clear. Transgressive women must be controlled or removed, so female readers are counseled against identification with the monstrous Lady Macbeth. Uh, in, in other words, as as important as having examples of virtuous Shakespearean heroines who incorporated the Victorian angel in the house, it is to have female characters that represent the very extreme, the image of the monster, that is to say, of rebellious, ambitious, violent, and powerful women. These unruly, unruly women are indeed present in fictional works, but at the end, they are punished with madness or death many times by their own hands, as Gilbert and Gubert famously analyzed in The Mad Woman in the Attic. As far as theatrical representations go, I would like to focus now on the most celebrated uh, interpretation of Lady Macbeth of, in the 19th century in Harry Irving's production. Um, the actress Ellen Terry introduced a strikingly different acting style and understanding of the Shakespearean character, not only in relation to the very popular editions of Shakespeare that we have just seen. Terry offers a tender and feminine interpretation of the Scottish, Scottish Queen, emphasizing how she was a gentle, loving wife to Macbeth. As the Victorian critic describes, there is nothing of the martial or adventurous spirit in her composition to bring her into harmony with her barbarian surroundings. On the contrary, she is a, wo a woman of warm sympathies, living in the tenderest... Okay, so I was talking about Ellen Terry that she introduced a strikingly different acting style. So she offers this very feminine interpretations of the Scottish Queen. Um, and this Victorian critic, I'm, I'm going to quote, there is nothing of the martial or adventurous spirit in her composition um, to bring her into harmony with her barbarous surroundings. On the contrary, she is a woman of warm sympathies, living in the tenderest relation with her husband." Unquote. 
to be suddenly transformed into the image of the um, angel in the house would be a bit exaggerated for the likes of Lady Macbeth. But Alan Terry was talented enough to make the Scottish Queen conform to the ideal of womanhood at the time, and that's why she was successful. Our last example from the 19th century comes from the visual arts, with this iconic painting of Lady Macbeth by John Singer Sargent. I'm sure everybody has seen it. It's already there? Oh, good. Close up. OK, uh, yeah, I just left it there so you could compare the two different uh, approaches to, the, to Lady Macbeth. Um, so Alan Terry's stage work was the initial inspiration for the life-size portrait entitled Alan Terry as Lady Macbeth, which the artist made during the play's premiere in London. Terry is wearing her costume, which I had the pleasure of seeing in display in the actress house in Kent, um, England last year. It is a splendid dress embroidered with a thousand beetle wings that has recently been restored. They spend a hundred thousand, a hundred and ten thousand pounds on the restoration. Um, the portrait pulls together the image of the actress and of the Shakespearean character. The moral ambiguity of this painting lies in the consecration of the divine Ellen Terry into the diabolical Lady Macbeth, a creature who seems about to step out of her frame. Shakespeare is indeed the catalyst for Sargent's vision of a monumental Ellen Terry at her moment of self-transfiguration. But as we have seen in the previous textual and stage representations, his text is left behind in favor of the ambiguous image of womanhood. As if usurping the crown from her husband, Lady Macbeth raises it to her head, a scene that neither occurred in Shakespeare nor in Irving's production. To sum up, the 19th century has a torn image of Shakespeare and a torn image of women. The Shakespeare targeted for children and women and the Shakespeare from the Bowdlers and the Lambs um, and the dangerous and sexual Shakespeare in the scholarly editions. Lady Macbeth's <coughs> image, as we saw, is also split. While the stage tried to recover her femininity and emphasize that she was a loving wife and partner for Macbeth, thus feeding the image of the angel in the house, on the other hand, expurgated texts incorporated her in the image of the fallen demonia woman to serve as a negative example. Naturally, different readings of Lady M on the stage, in the movies, and critically have multiplied in the 20th and 21st centuries. But significantly, Ellen Terry's divine demoniac, Lady Macbeth, is essentially what has penetrated the popular imagination. Lady Macbeth's afterlife in the American media illustrates how people are fascinated with the character. So much so that her name has become synonymous with powerful, ambitious women, with cold-blooded women. For example, since Bill Clinton was president, Hillary Clinton has received many comparisons to the Scottish Queen. <laughs> Before her, the focus was, of course, the late, the late Iron Lady, but Nancy Pelosi, Condoleezza Rice, have also been depicted as Lady Anne. Another one. Oh, Poor thing. Oh, my God. So these political reconstructions of Lady Macbeth reinforce a very interesting side to the Shakespearean character, how she has been culturally appropriated as a vehicle for social satire or critique of a woman who challenges the natural order of things, a demoniac woman. As the witches in Macbeth would say, fair is foul, foul is fair. <coughs> now we come to the second part of this talk. Um, if Lady Macbeth plays an important role in depicting a powerful woman in popular culture, Ophelia is an even more far-reaching cultural phenomenon of how a fictional character transgresses the limits of the page to, to achieve the status of myth in 
her case, a phenomenon that has intrigued me for more years than I feel comfortable sharing with you today. <laughs> Ophelia's remarkable visibility in culture is so intriguing because she is paradoxically shrouded in, in um, critical invisibility until feminist criticism rescued her in the 1980s. So she was almost like 370 years in, you know, shrouded in, in, in invisibility. Um, conventionally considered a minor character in Hamlet, a tragedy that's permeated with grandiosities, Ophelia's story is dependent on the three men in her life, her father Polonius, her brother Laertes, and Hamlet. When she's deprived of these three references, her father dies, her brother is absent, and Hamlet um, rejects her, Ophelia goes mad and dies as a victim of a patriarchal society. Therefore, to talk about Ophelia in the Shakespearean text is to talk about silence, rejection, repression, madness in that, and this is the main reason mainstream criticism avoided her. Critics like Dr. Johnson in the 18th century, for example, maintained that Shakespeare violated the canon of decorum and the, the ideal of poetic justice in his creation of Ophelia. He should not have permitted Hamlet to be so vulgar and rude towards her, and he should not have given Ophelia an untimely, untimely death. <laughs> Hazlitt, in the 19th, 19th century, claims that Ophelia is a character, and I quote, almost too exquisitely touching to be dwelt upon. And Bradley, in the 20th century, affirms that in the love and the fate of Ophelia herself, it was introduced an element not of deep tragedy, but of pathetic beauty, which makes the analysis of her character seem almost a desecration, unquote. Despite the rejection of Fida received in criticism, in ironic exchange, however, she attains the status of an archetypal model, as well as a cult heroine, and becomes one of Shakespeare's most textualized female characters. So how can we understand this paradox? Similar to Lady Macbeth, Ophelia was submitted to different types of textual expurgations in popular editions such as Family Shakespeare, Tales from Shakespeare, and other cautionary editions in the form of conduct manuals such as Shakespeare and Heroines. There are many others. Her domesticated versions, uh, textual versions, helped her occupy center stage in Victorian, in Victorian culture. So let's first uh, look at the Family Shakespeare. When I first talked about the family Shakespeare in relation to Lady M, I did not mention that the first edition was attributed to Thomas <coughs> Boulder, but was in fact undertaken by his sister, Henrietta, who referred to Ophelia's death as accidental drown drowning, omitting any suggestions of suicide. Henrietta was in fact much more aggressive in editing the plays than her brother. But in later, later editions, Thomas restores yeah. the vers version of suicide and carefully fine-tunes his configuration of Ophelia. In all scenes, he rejects words or insinuations voiced by Ophelia that were considered obscene, but preserves some sexual innuendos addressed to her by her father, her brother, and Hamlet, with the purpose of illustrating, to use Shakespeare's words, the dangers of desire for girls who unmask their beauties to the moon. The scenes that remain unaltered are the ones where male characters speak and Ophelia merely answers. Therefore, her voice remains empty and can only be filled by the men in her life. The painstaking effort that both Henrietta and her brother Thomas put in reconfiguring Ophelia, particularly her suicide, demonstrates how she was perceived as ambiguous and dangerous. Similar reconfigurations of Ophelia can be found in virtually all 19th century editions that adapted Hamlet. Let's briefly look at one more example which sentimentalizes Hamlet and Ophelia. This is an illustration from Tales from Shakespeare. Tales from Shakespeare, which was adapted by Charles Lamb, transforms, by Charles and Mary Lamb, 
but what happened was that Charles Lamb undertook, he, he, he uh, reconfigured all the tragedies, and his sister did all the comedies. Um, so it was adopted you know, by him, transforms Hamlet into a fable, and eliminates political questions that are essential in Shakespeare's texts, such as the usurpation of the throne. Lamb also removes important traits of some characters, or even characters altogether, such as Fortinbras, Rosencrantz, and Wilderson. Ophelia appears as a sweet, dutiful maiden, obedient to her father and to Hamlet, who, contrary to the source text, never displays any hostility towards her. Also eliminated is the infamous nunnery scene, where Hamlet urges Ophelia to enter a nunnery, rather than become a breeder of sinners. And you will remember that in Shakespeare's time, nunnery could also mean brothel, so he was calling her a whore. <laughs> With the cuts and silencing, silence, silencing of her already meager lines, Ophelia becomes a mere decoration in the narrative. She is only important in as much she makes Hamlet look noble. She also functions as a counterpoint to Gertrude, um, who is transformed into a fairy tale stepmother. Significantly also, her death is depicted as a natural consequence of her distracted mind after her father's death. She loses her memory and wanders the Danish court, aimlessly distributing flowers to other girls and dies a poetic, watery death. Why not noteworthy? By removing Ophelia's memory, this edition deprives her of any possible individuality and evidences her lack of agency. It is also worth pointing the reach of this edition. Tales from Shakespeare was reprinted over 30 times in the 19th century. It has become a milestone in literature for children. It is frequently used still to introduce Shakespeare not only in English uh, speaking countries, but also in translation. And as we saw, the Ophelia that we encounter here is nothing like the ambiguous heroine that Shakespeare conceived. <coughs> On the stage, we're going to look again at Ellen Terry. Um, in her interpretation of Ophelia, Terry actually became famous through her renditions of Shakespearean heroines. Harry Irving, the actor manager who directed her and who played Hamlet, rewrote the script and seriously mutilated the text, <coughs> specifically Ophelia's life. So he re-articulated the dialogues and filtered all the indecorous words in the many sexual allusions made by Hamlet, mainly in the play within the play scene. These words are indeed important because they put Ophelia's modesty and chastity into perspective and give her ambiguity. In the same vein, some of Ophelia's ballads are deleted and the ones that remain eliminate all the obscene words. Ophelia, who has a very small part in Shakespeare's text, she only has 58 lines. I think um, Hamlet has 1,150 lines. Um, so she is reduced to a pathetic, childlike figure. She loses her tragic contour and is adjusted to the morals of the time. Again, in the vein of most plays, Ophelia is sacrificed for the sake of Hamlet to celebrate a tragic hero. But then, how can we explain Terry's Ophelia remarkable success in the 19th century? It was the most important uh, role. Well, plays are not only composed of speech. Rather, they are made alive by performance, gesture, music, setting, lighting. Ellen Terry's Ophelia was the most successful one because it, it, um, of the century. It's true that by that time, Terry was considered a myth on the Victorian theater, and she really did not become a myth uh, by accident. She carefully reconsidered her impersonation of Ophelia. She was shrewd enough to understand that she would have to adopt an essentially physical approach in interpreting the heroine if she couldn't shine through the text she would shine through her amazing physique. 
In her diary, Terry recounts details about the interpretation, her interpretation, the, re the rehearsals in her choices of costume. Very wisely, she chooses pictorial acting, a style of acting that originated in the 18th century that makes uses of gestures, plus plastique or plastic poses, and codified um, facial expressions to mark Ophelia's delicate presence on the stage. With pictorial acting, the actor expresses himself not only through words, but also through these codified gestures and movement. <laughs> um, like, like these photographs, yeah. In fact, actors were encouraged to study classic paintings and statues in order to pose as if in a painting. This is when theatrical performances became made more and more visual, sometimes excessively so. But Ellen Terry knew that in general, a predominantly visual performance would guarantee more success than one which favored the text. So she worked really hard in her conception of Ophelia, and even visited a mental asylum to observe mad women to prepare for her role. Um, by 1878, doctors had already established that Shakespeare's Ophelia provided a model for female hysteria. So Terry's physical interpretation dialogued not only with the already flourishing icon uh, iconography that de depicted the, the Shakespearean heroine, but also with the medical area to which Ophelia was a model of female madness. The result was by far the most successful Ophelia, but not the mad Ophelia not the ambiguous Ophelia, but a domesticated Victorian version of Ophelia. Even her madness was very domesticated. So if family editions in the theater offered domesticated renditions of Ophelia, let's see what happened to iconography. And now we'll let the images speak for themselves. Ophelia became a muse for English and French visual artists in the 19th century. She was depicted in paintings, watercolors, drawings, and sculptures, rapidly occupying the number one place as subject matter in literary <coughs> painting, a genre that flourished in Victorian England. Generally, favorite scenes are the mad scene, floral portraits with her hair adorned in gardens of flowers, but by far the most popular one, especially after 1950s, uh, 1850s, uh, is the scene of her drowning. And it's no exaggeration to say that no image of Ophelia has entered so strongly in our cultural consciousness as Milan's Ophelia, because it continues to be endlessly reproduced in popular culture. Millet translated as faithfully as possible Gertrude's highly poetic and indeed highly visual description of Ophelia's uh, death. Much of the text, this is a painting that highlights the beauty of the moment of Ophelia's watery death. The Shakespearean heroine does not resist the forces that act on her. The brook receives the beautiful nymph, who in turn surrenders sacrificially into a ritual, in a ritual of mutual acceptance. Encased in an exquisite rendering of brightly colored plants, flowers, and other vegetations, 
Her hands extend with open palms in a sublime submission to death. In Ophelia's association with water and nature, Millet's image is essentially inscribed in the tradition of myth narratives that link women with water or nature and the feminine with fluidity. Such narratives explore the romantic trope advocated by Edgar Allan Poe, that I quote, the death of a beautiful woman is unquestionably the most poetical topic in the world. <laughs> Indeed, representations of beautiful, mad, dying, or dead women remain a favorite way of depicting passive feminine crit that sacrifice, confirming a male obsession with death as an ideal of feminine submission. <laughs> These depictions are so abundant in society even nowadays, not only in the 19th century, in different forms, right? That they have become unrepresentable, in other words, invisible. They have become so normalized that we don't perceive them anymore. This paradox can be experienced right now in our visual apprehension of, of Miles Ophelia. The emphasis goes to the aesthetic side, to how beautiful the painting is, to how realistically it is painted rather than the actual thing, which is the death of a woman. This is the most famous um, postcard at Tate, the Tate Gallery, by the way. Since the 18th century, visual representations of Ophelia have proven to be extremely prolific. One intriguing peculiarity in the different modes of depicting the Shakespearean heroine is how girls and young women are irresistibly drawn to her tragic story and desire to be represented um, as the heroine, a trend that started in the 19th century in the form of the popular carte de visite, which were a kind of visiting cards, and keepsake portraits. Tales recounting how actresses and models identified with Ophelia are also evidence of this tendency. Nowadays, this is even more visible. Teenage girls and young women pose as Ophelia in swimming pools and bathtubs and publish their pictures in the web. Uh, while many would consider the identification with a tragic fi figure inescapably linked with madness and suicide, an